What is up, guys? Welcome to the Next Level Esports Podcast, the number one podcast for esports coaches. My name is Donnie, and today will be awesome because we got Jensen Go on the show, and he has been a coach to LEC, Mad Lions, former LCS team, Immortals, and coached in almost any region in the world, and was the head coach of one of the most prestigious collegiate esports programs at Maryville University. And Jensen has won three domestic championships across the world in Spain, Vietnam, and Australia. And on today's podcast, he will be sharing some valuable insights into his ways and system to become a better coach and how to win championships. So Jensen, welcome and thank you for doing this. How are you doing, man? Oh, pretty great. MSI just concluded. I think it was uh, a blast. I love the new format for MSI and watching the top Asian teams get to play each other in the double elimination bracket really reignited a lot of my passion for the tactical aspects of the game. Yeah, pretty awesome because it was pretty unexpected that the LPL basically got to the, the top spots, right? It's the LPL final, if, I corre- if I'm correct. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of teams were expecting JDG to be in contention. I personally predicted JDG to win, but BLG making the run all the way to the finals through both the Korean teams as well. That was the big upset that people were not expecting. Yeah, it it was pretty amazing. I watched some games, not everyone, but usually like the finals. I watched and it was pretty pretty high quality uh, league play. So that was pretty awesome. So uh, Jensen, just to get straight in, um, maybe some of the viewers already know you, uh, some of them don't. So to, just to start right off and to, you know, hand the mic over to you, not many coaches have coached, you know, in so many different regions as you. So can you tell, uh, tell a little bit about the backstory and your journey as a coach uh, as a start and how you got to coach to all of these different regions? So my first year coaching was actually in 2017, where I started out in the what is now known as the PCS, but was formerly known as the LMS, where I was picked up to start coaching a team in Taiwan. Before that, I was helping out in the capacity of, uh, I would say, effectively a coach, but I would never really call myself that, uh, helping the teams domestically in Singapore, uh, because that's uh, I would always say that coaching is an institutional position, so you have to be installed into a position as a coach. And then back then, when you're just volunteering to help out with teams, what well, you are effectively taking on the, the, the roles and responsibilities of a coach, you aren't going to be have the same efficacy of, of one because of the lack of legitimacy. So for all purposes, I would say that my coaching journey only officially started in 2017 when I started professionally coaching for the LMS team, Fireball. So if you all recall, mm. it's like one of those like, what the memeiest uh, team icons out there, there's this fat kid that's on fire, right? If you go all the way to 20, <laughs> 2017, you search under the LMS segment of it, there's this fat kid on fire. That was the one team it, it existed for one year i coached that team for one half of the year and um that was the start of my coaching journey and since then it has been taking me from taiwan to china to vietnam uh to europe where i was helping out with the uh then it was known as splice and then that was when they they had the merger to become met lions before i went to australia for a little bit uh returned to the pcs now it, it then became the pcs before heading to america in the most recent two years as well it has been quite a journey Mm -hmm. And I think that I, it gives me lots of perspectives on what are the different cultural challenges in terms of like integrating players across different environments, being a coach and establishing the dynamic of players uh, across different cultures as well, and the unique right. challenges and how the esports industry has kind of evolved and changed in the various regions as well. Yeah, so like uh, I, I have to ask, right? Because you make it come across like it's so easy to travel between regions. Like, oh, I coached here, I coached there, and uh, like uh, miss a worldwide, you know. Uh, uh, you've been basically everywhere. Um, you know, there are some coaches probably watching right now that are thinking like, that's pretty awesome. I want to follow your footstep. How do you get from region to region? Can you maybe tell, uh, tell us a little bit, like, how do you set yourself up to you know, of course, you have to be good at what you do, right? That is, I believe, you know, the the elephant in the room. But is there anything else to it if you want to coach in different regions and also be, you know, getting the experience from different regions? Because I think that can be a very rich experience to compare everything. So there's a few layers in which I can answer this question, right? The first is uh, um, the simple advice I give people is know your value. Know very clearly what is the unique selling point you bring to the table. What is it that you're pitching to a team and what is the value that you're trying to bring to the table? Uh, We can talk about this later on when I break down the elements of coaching. But for me, I always pitch myself as somebody who is very structured in terms of providing systems and structure to players. And it's one of the things that I do in the kind of a one-to-punch combination where a lot of times 
times, I'm actually reaching out to teams and saying that I'm willing to troll with you guys for free. I'm willing to work with you guys for free. And I know that this is something that uh, as esports has evolved and as mm-hmm. we move into the latter stages, uh, into the later days of esports, it's a lot harder to just simply show up and volunteer at a, at a team because everybody's doing it. But when I first started out, uh, coaching wasn't really established. Riot just said, okay, we need a coaching position here. And teams were, kind, were still kind of figuring out, okay, what are we looking for in a coach? Uh, what exactly is the role of a coach in a team? And it was a lot of being in the right place at the right time for me. And just knowing this, uh, the right people in some scenarios or just having, uh, just being in the right place to make the right cold calls to say, hey, uh, I'm right. going to do these sort of things for free. Is there available vacancy? And it just so happened that there was one due to whatever factor, due to whatever reason that they could bring me in, have me come on initially most of the time as a consultant and then later on uh, transition that into an actual position with the team itself. Yeah, so in terms of like summary, right? In my own wording, so you you have to say if that that is the correct summary. So you say you have to know your value, but also what is basically upfront in your approach is you have to provide value first, right? You have to go in and be able to demonstrate your worth, your value. What can you bring? And that's how you say, or uh, what you mentioned, like. Oh, let me work for free. Let me just try. Maybe it's a little bit different right now, right? It's not 2016, 17, 18, right? It's uh, it going, it's it's going pretty fast in terms of development and professionalism. We're not there yet, but I understand what you're saying. Um, so there, I believe that's a, that's some good advice. And the the second thing that you mentioned is right. You your USB your unique your unique selling point is basically your systems right and structure and that is basically the whole topic of this podcast. So thank you for building the bridge <laughs> in, in that sense. So um, I contacted you because on Twitter you mentioned like I'm willing to share and provide systems for the collegiate esports system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I want to you know provide my value up front as well. So I believe this is a good. Um, opportunity for you to showcase a little bit to talk about your systems your structures and everything to share that and also write for other coaches and other enthusiasts uh, that are willing to learn from you to you know take a golden nugget uh, one or two from you so when we're talking about systems or structure what do you mean with that just to start very broadly and then we narrow it down to some specific systems um as we go but what what for your maybe newer coaches what are like systems and structure what do we have to think about that when we mention that so when i usually do workshops to introduce people to what uh, coaching is like in esports i usually preface all of this by saying that there's four big domains to coaching itself the first domain is your knowledge domain and this is the thing that i think a lot of people on Twitter, a lot of analysts uh, kind of assume that coach has to do, right? It's either this one or one of the other domains that I'll talk about later on, where it's a lot about uh, knowing the in-game uh, intricacies, mm-hmm. right? About this is how you structure macro, this is the tactics that you use, this is the strategy that you have. And that is, I would say, is one of the, the major domains. This is about 25%, right? So each domain, I would say, is 25% each. And okay. th- this is the first major domain. So. The first one is the knowledge domain, deals with everything that has to do with the in-game system, right? How do I trade? How do I rotate around the map? What are these champion matchups like? And uh, what, is this the, what is your prescribed approach on this matter, for example? The second domain is the performance domain. And then this is where I think a lot of esports teams over the last five years or so, they have really been catching up in this area, where it's about figuring out, okay, how do we find our peak performance, right? Concepts such as periodization, uh, teams hiring sports psychologists to come in to help players uh, regulate their emotions, regulate the way that they handle pressure and respond to these sort of things accordingly, managing mm. for diet, managing for sleep. These are elements of the performance area. Or if you look in more traditional coaching language, we talk about it as neural linguistics programming uh that's the school of thought that some people subscribe to as well what is the self talk what's your inner dialogue that you use, exactly. use for yourself and what's the type of language that you use to respond to scenarios and threats this kind of counts under the performance domain um the third domain is the relationships domain where i would uh classify it as intra and inter team right uh, uh intra inter and extra team right so intra team is basically what is the player to player dimension uh dimensions like what's the player to player relationships like what's the player to coach relationship like and how do you manage an account for for all of that are the players generally friendly with each other are they on a quarter relationship are they pushing each other as much as you would like them to um and where do you come in as a coach these are the questions that you answer in the relationship domain and for a very high information very high knowledge based game such as league of legends Relationships are also 
are very important in terms of mm. how do you network and find out what's happening around the world. So these are your extra team relationships. And uh, other examples of extra team relationships are um, things like who are the source of psychological support that your players tend to, right? Is it a healthy source of support or is this something that it's uh, they're finding catharsis in and using it as an escape to help them out with instead of confronting problems with their team? So uh, examples of healthy relationships is say that they have a significant other and then they turn to the significant other to find confidence, to find support, to find reassurance in, in the times of need. It's important to know these style of things as well so right. that you can kind of design for that um, in your ability to help this player overcome difficulty, right? Because it is very emotionally frustrating as it can be a very emotionally difficult process being a pro player at the, at the various levels, and especially a, a game as volatile of League of Legends, where it's not even say a slump because you're performing, you're not performing in your career. A bad change comes and then all of a sudden you're experiencing all the stress as you need to learn something new and you might not be picking up as fast as your team needs you to. And having and knowing where your players can find that support is uh, really important as well and, and helping them direct them towards uh, to utilizing the right sources of support is, is an important part of it. And inter-team yeah. relationships are about uh, how do your players interact with the the competition in general, right? And that one is, I would say, it differs from um, from level to level, but it's something that you have to factor as well, in as well as the total domain. So these are 25%, uh, three domains, 75%. And then the last domain, I just call it the systems domain, where it's not so much about the what you do, but how do you do it. So it's how do you code these things into a specific manner where you can write it out as a form of standard operating procedure, but how do you create autonomy? How do you create a sense of... Um, automation right within what you've established so far so that if say you need to call in sick for a day or need to attend to some personal matters you know that things are going to run fine in your team so performance is all about building the it's all about helping the team reach the ceiling systems is about raising the floor you know that on our worst day, we can be suffering from food poisoning, we can be jet lagged, we can all be suffering from some major sickness or whatsoever, and we can show up on stage and we can be playing absolutely terrible, but no matter how bad we play, our floor will be higher than our opponent's ceiling. And exactly. this is where systems are coming into play because it sets a it sets a very clear flaw. Uh, be it from the knowledge perspective of things to say that this is what what we can do, or to say the performance perspective of things where you can enforce particular routines within within a player to, to the relationship domain of things to understand that okay, this is how you're going to respond or help the team overcome a major conflict where you have a high high um, high tension scenario and you have to resolve that by creating out of team bonding or creating a positive experience uh, later on for the players so that the the day-to-day -day, uh, pressure doesn't necessarily get to them. So these are the four big domains of coaching. And uh, as to what the systems are, it kind of like goes into which one, right? Are you just talking about how do you uh, handle the in-game systems where uh, it's something that I have used uh, to rather accurately predict the results of some major finals i think most famously was uh when i mapped out uh the how game one of suning versus that one would go and that world championship i think was in 20, 2020 and when i was able mm -hmm. to predict how edg would win the finals as well in 2021 uh drx beating t1 i do not think anybody could have predicted that but i think that my ability to map out a team's macro patterns and how they interact with one another uh is one of the the proof of concepts that i have uh, when it comes to the systems that I have uh, in terms of understanding in-game uh, League of Legends. And I think for the others as well, I, I guess we can go on and touch on each of them accordingly. But yeah. I, wanna, I think it'll be a lot easier if you if you just ask me questions instead. Or else yeah, I'll no, just be talking over the next two hours. Of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we'll be talking for sure for two hours and you'll be doing most of the talking. But, you know, so, uh, you know, I like to uh, summarize, you know, for for, uh, for everyone. Uh, so I, I wrote it down, you know, a little bit of a, a sketch uh, on my document that I have opened. Uh, so the first domain is like the in-game system. Second domain is the performance domain basically sports psychology diet you know self-talk everything and then the third domain is relationship to intra extra and the fourth domain is really about the systems about how you do things and about raising the floor um so you know when i was listening to you it sounds to me like you have to understand and know you know a little bit about everything not maybe on a basic level but more like on an intermediate advanced level, you know, if you want to be, you know, somewhat, you know, proficient in any of these domains. So my question to you is how did you develop all of these, 
you know, domains. Did you took this idea from somewhere? Uh, where did you learn about like uh, the uh, the performance domain, what you call it in terms of sports psychology? Are you also uh, interfering, quote unquote, with like dietary and self talk? And how did you develop all of these things, right? Because I think it's so valuable, and I wish more coaches basically have at least a basic understanding of what, what you are saying. But how do you get towards this basic understanding, intermediate and even advanced type of, you know, domains that you, that you just mentioned? So um, I think knowledge is something as somebody who started as a shortcaster, watched a lot of the game, that's something that you will pick up over time. And the funny thing was that uh, one of my friends, who is also one of the big coaches in the space, Nelson, who's also a Singaporean, used to mm. say that, oh, the Western coaches, they battle every possible macro scenario in the game. And I was like, okay, well, that's interesting. And I took that on as a little bit of a project as to how do you model systems, right? And I think in uh, university, when you do like math, you do like any form of uh, engineering, if you do deal with a lot of theoretical physics engineering and things mm -hmm. like that you have to work a lot of modeling systems and that's a very big part of right. research so i said okay i'm just gonna take this as a challenge of sorts can i try to come up with a little bit of a predictive model uh to either understand the game or to help players uh parse the game down and do some career structures right and i think that i even when I first started coaching, I was really using what uh, some people would call flowchart League of Legends, where it's a lot about if you break it down to computer coding terms, it's uh, into if-else decision trees, right? If if X, therefore Y, if A, therefore B, right? Else yeah. you go C, else you go Z. And uh, that was something that I, I leaned into very heavily. So I said, okay, for in-game systems, let's try to do this a little bit more. And then over time, you have the patch notes that, that come in. Uh, not the in-game patch notes, but you, you patch notes your, your own system to figure out, okay, uh, you stress test it, you look at, okay, what makes sense in this scenario? What doesn't make sense? And then you have right. to watch pro games, you watch the information your team is collecting, and you develop this over time. And at the end of the day, uh, the system that I, I largely teach, while I'm able to model uh, what I believe are the three big ways to play the game at the moment, is very closely towards the two-lane map control style of playing the game. Uh, as for mm. the other things, I would say that in terms of how do I learn these things, uh, for me, it's, uh, I mean, this is where the difference is when you're coaching in um, small teams becomes very apparent to when you're coaching with bigger teams with bigger coaching staff and bigger, bigger expectations, right? Like when okay. I'm coaching in minor regions and things like that, I, I do not have to be an official dietitian to, to, to give people um, untrained and unprofessional advice, but you just <laughs> know are correct, right? Things yeah. like you should not be drinking Red Bull before you go to bed, right? Sounds very, really, very smart. <laughs> yes, it, it sounds, it thinks that you shouldn't be drinking coffee before you go to bed, or even things like um, you you can look at the science and you can then say that, yeah, it's not a good idea for you to be taking this much caffeine before a game. Right. This is when you should be taking caffeine in a five game uh, best of series and things like that. And then when you go to, to, to a larger team, uh, these are the other things where they have people on staff that are more hired, they're more trained to do these sort of things. Where, whereas you're exercising a common sense um, is. Sometimes common sense cannot be as common, right? So there's all sorts of things that I, right. I found to be very useful for myself because before I started coaching in, in esports, I used to play with competitive uh, Magic the Gathering and all sorts of other games as well. Mm. And I always find that these tournaments, they're going for 9 or 10 hours. And I, whenever I reach yeah. hour 8, 9, and 10, I started to perform very poorly, right? Um, and I didn't really understand why. I always thought that it's because oh, maybe I had a crutch of being a loser's, of having a loser's mentality where I would tell myself, yeah, reaching the finals is enough and things like that. Or, or uh, my self-talk was just poor. It was part of it, but part of it as well was that I was not uh, managing my recovery and my between round uh, planning. Right, when I'm exactly. Playing these nine round card game tournaments, these ten round card game tournaments, where you go eat a heavy lunch, you come back, you chuck a bunch of caffeine, and then by the time <laughs> you're at hour nine, you're just completely gassed out. And I'm wondering, yeah. well, am I making these bad decisions? And I just go going home, like beating myself up over it when I when I lost like national championships, so I like yeah. second place for for things like Warhammer, for like Netrunner, and it wasn't Magic the Gathering, but it's like these other smaller games where I would be finishing second place in these national championships time after time. And it's only after when I started working in esports and I talked to these people from the sports side of things. So when I see the articles they write online, then I realized that, oh, okay. So maybe it wasn't 
that uh, I lacked talent or whatever I was telling myself back then. I was literally inting myself because I was <laughs> uh, eating too heavy of a lunch. I was uh, drinking too much caffeine and things like that. So um, in more recent times, I, I actually found that like putting these style things, I used to joke with my friends, right, where they'll ask me if I'm going to eat before an event and things like that. I would say, uh, if you've ever watched Scott Pilgrim, it's that no vegan diet, no vegan powers, you know? Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll actually just go fasted into the event itself. I'll eat a light snack in between rounds and then I'll tell either right. a heavy meal at the end of the day. Um, so right. so that I'm, I'm applying these lessons that I've learned. Uh, and like the hydration plan in, in between rounds and all these sort of things as well and it's helped me out immensely but because I'm not a trained sports uh, performance person I only can say these things anecdotally to say that these things have helped me and I also right. have to be careful in the capacity that I do it because as a coach when I tell these two players that I work with directly depending in terms of the, their relationship I may or may not be allowed to do that depending on the place, the country and the expectations that I'm in yeah for but, sure but in terms of like, like, how do I learn these style things, it's a lot about, um, I, I would say, it's once again, it's a very dangerous school of like self-thought, you know, because you're not licensed, you're not doing anything. So do I understand these things at intermediate or advanced level? Not really. I, I've taken the time to go and see the science behind it. I've talked to professionals in the field, and I know enough to kind of know that if somebody comes up to me and they tell me that they're, they're a sports performance specialist and all they do is try to give the Disney talk um, before every game, I know that, okay, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for somebody who can design nutrition plans, who can who can right. actually give this so-called common sense advice, right? to the players that, that I'm working with. And of course, once again, this depends on the, the team that you're working with, the expectations they're working with. If you're a small team, you know, nobody's going to say that, oh, my coach gave me this illegal advice about the thing. He told me that I shouldn't drink coffee before I go to bed. You yeah, know? someone called the cops. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that, there's the element to it. And of course, relationships, that's, I would say, is, it's, the, it's the bread and butter of any coaching or leadership position. Yeah. Right? The, the be, 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 before, be, uh, I just want, want to, you know, what you just covered, Right. Um, it kind of resonates with me. Right. Maybe it's it, it sounds like, oh, you're just a, a guy that likes to, you know, play some games, some Warhammer, you know, like uh, in terms of like just call it like there. Maybe people are watching this and feel like, oh, well, you know, that's a pretty nerdy stuff. But I am, you know, also a nerd like that because I used to play, uh, you know, Medic the Gathering. I still have Warhammer here in my in my closet, you know, the miniatures. I just even um uh, painted uh, uh, like yeah, I, I painted like a cave troll type of thing uh, this last week. You know, um, the thing why I want to stand still with that is like your story is not only just like hey, I developed system. You talked about I was going to university. I uh, understood you know engineering about systems implementations. It's like a little bit of like human coding. If this happens, then. You have to fill in the prompt or, you know, have some deviations or of where you want to go with the particular solutions to be efficient, to be effective. Uh, and that, I believe that's a type of thinking that got you where you are right now. But you've collected those types of, you know, insights based on, I believe, one side, your interests, like the things you've went through and also developed. At the same time, I believe it's also a little bit part of your personality, very rational, very logically, you know, being very meticulous with, with those things. So at the same time, I'm like, yeah, right. I completely understand where you're coming from. At the same time, I feel like, okay, not all the coaches are playing Magic the Gathering or have that interest or not playing Warhammer or not doing all of these engineering stuff or went to university. Um, may, maybe, uh, you know, it, it's a slight, you know, sidestep. But before we go in, right, maybe for people that feel like, okay, I don't have this background in engineering and everything, uh, maybe uh, you're, uh, you're losing me because I feel like, oh, I'm incompetent. I cannot do these things. What would you say to those coaches that are feeling like, okay, but I don't have that background. I don't have that insight. I don't have the, you know, how can they develop to start to think about systems? What are maybe some exercises or, or ways to pick up the speed to, you know, get where you are and to get a little bit of understanding of the way you think and, you know, structure things? Well, I mean, I wouldn't say that everybody needs a background in engineering or engineering training because sure honestly speaking we i i did this thing called the design century program and at my university for engineering so while it was mainly for engineering students 
I actually felt that working with the, the students from the arts faculties was always the most interesting because they understood something that um, a lot of engineers don't is that at the end of the day, your product is used by people. Right. Mm, so you can right. always have the, the most and engineers, they always focus on like, OK, how can I optimize this? How can I min max that <laughs> in, in gamer terms? Right? How can I min max the yeah. DPS and, and all those kind of things? And um, it's, it's the, the League of Legends equivalent of that is this over obsession with like what's the right item build and all that kind of stuff. Right. And at the end of the day, it's honestly speaking, it's a very small part of coaching. Right. So you don't you don't need an engineering background or, or those type of thinkings. Well, it does help you. Right to to think about sure. how do you design products and things like that. At the end of the day, it's about uh, learning how to design um, dynamic solutions in uncomfortable environments. And mm. while I would say that engineering training does help you with that, it's a it's a very modern day problem, right? How do you look at what people are saying, what people are doing, which actually kind of ties into what I was saying about the relationships domain, where mm. um, if you've ever watched this show called Dr. House, right? One of his famous lines is that, one of the very yeah. famous premises of the show is that he hates talking to patients because patients always lie, right? <laughs> and you don't have to take it to the extreme where, yep, these people are always lying. And of course, it's dramatized in a particular way. But it's, it's about one of the things that uh, I always used to say when people to like design uh try to design systems based on like feedback and and information that that they that they collect is that uh surveys suck right surveys give you nothing but fake data because mm. or they have lupus right right yeah that's what you always say it's, it's like, like never a lupus, joke, right? right yeah but um <laughs> it's it's this entire idea that uh, uh so when you ask people what they want they're going to tell you a lot of things but what they say isn't actually what they're looking for exactly so, when you're looking at the relationships domain, when you're looking at trying to uncover what people's motivations are, you don't just ask them. You really have to uh, try to figure it out. You, you are doing a diagnosis of sorts, right? Like Dr. House, right? You have to go in there. And of course, you don't have to do the whole Sherlock Holmes things where the, the shoes are clean, means that he has got like, he hasn't worn them or he has got like this. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to over look into it. But what I always say is that realize that actions uh, will reveal people's true intentions louder than words, right? Mm. Everybody's going to tell you that they love the game, right? But you know what yeah. tells you if a player loves still loves playing League of Legends? If they came to you and say that, Coach, I dreamt about the game yesterday night, or you see that they are playing 17 games of solo queue every day unprompted, right? You're not setting yeah. a quota, you're not setting a limit, they are just there, they're just spamming the game. And yeah. they're not there just complaining about how miserable they are. They're just very quietly doing it and they're just playing it. And that does, that those are signs that the player is enjoying the game. Not what the player says, that, oh, I enjoy playing the game. So there's all these physical things that you can look for as well. And it's not just about uh, an A or B kind of response. And of course, there are ways to cheat these style things. But a lot of times, sorry, uh, not to cheat on their part, but to, but to uh, more effectively deduce these style things based on the players that you have and based on how you craft your, your feedback loops. But that's a important part about understanding relationships as well and a uh, very yeah. important part about uh, the performance aspect as well right in terms of where there's motivation is and all that kind of stuff which is i think something they wrote about in your book right in terms of player motivation yeah yeah but um sorry if i went on a little bit of tension over there but no I, I no no it, to, it to was say great. that that if even if you don't have an engineering background i mean this is one of the pieces of advice that my dad always tell me right like regardless where you are you you always need a system right and the system is uh which is contrary to what people say it's like you always need to have a plan right because a lot of people they, they have a plan it's like i'm gonna do a i'm gonna be do b i'm gonna do c what's the problem with that right it's the mo famous muhammad ali quote everyone has a plan until they get hit in the face yeah right <laughs> exactly but when you have a system you know what exactly to fall back on so if you get hit in the face you know because you've been trained the muscle memory is that the muscle memory now no, it's a system mm. and you know how to respond there's all these uh guidelines that can guide you along and uh, not only does it uh, create more consistency for you in terms of like your testing, in terms of your learning lessons moving forward as well. If you operate within the system, it's easier to take lessons away from your failures as well because you're now more easily able to isolate to say that, okay, these are the problems in my approach, right? Did I mismanage this particular domain? Is this is that particular flaw in my system over here that results in uh, the result of mm -hmm. whatever scenario that might have happened? Yeah. So, so, so in order to, to jump to jump in, right? What I'm thinking about. So, I'm not sure if you notice. Uh, he's a famous investor. Uh, I value a lot. He's called Ray Dalio, and he's called like a book principles. And it's basically he sh he sees business or life, and I you know uh, sort of uh, leeway it into coaching. He is all about like 
um, you want to have systems in place uh, also with people, you need to view your team or your business or wh whatever it is, like um, a system where it can produce consistent results. So in terms of why, what you're saying, I feel like, you know, those systems really help you to, um, you know, create consistent results. And also you have to manage it like an engineer or like a mechanic. Basically, there's always, you know, problems, there are things you need to fix. But if you have the system in place, you know where to look, right? I think usually nowadays or still on many coaches, uh, they have plans, but once it goes south and, you know, you know, they get hit in the face, they don't. Uh, they have to use their creativity to come up with solutions. And at first, at the beginning, maybe, you know, the first month of the split, you know, they are full with enthusiasm, energy, because they had a vacation or whatever, you know, uh, end of the season uh, type of break. But they cannot keep up with the creativity because it just expends so much energy. So it's not only about being efficient uh, from what I'm also hearing from you, but it's also about like, preserving energy and putting your attention to where it needs to be like observing that's also what i hear observing your players and your team right uh, what are they doing what are their actions does it um align with the system in place like where do i need to look instead of being all day in the trenches being creative to you know win the next game or to do this uh, and to you know um go step by step you know of course step by step but i guess uh, maybe you understand what I'm saying. Like it's more an overview of having a system rather than be in the trenches, being creative all the time to look for the best solution at, at, at any given time. So, so what do you think about that? Do you feel uh, like your your team also has like a system that you you know the way I describe it, or how do you view you know being a team? Is it a system for you in itself that you have to overview or to look at? Well, I mean, um, a system doesn't have to be doesn't always have to be um, that codified. That's a very uh, hard set of things that you have to do. It's just a set of guidelines that you have to follow, right? It can it can be something that is something that okay, I have to do this every day, which is a system in itself to a simple set of guidelines. You know that um, sometimes it's as simple as just telling yourself or saying that okay, for for the week, it's going to be about maximizing positivity. Right, maximizing positivity. That mm -hmm. itself, just by setting a guideline in, in itself, can be a system as well. Right? Yeah. But that that is what once we're talking about uh, prescribing solutions to particular problems that are happening on teams. And um, with the day to day of what's happening, it's really about it goes back to the, the core, what I call the four, the core four domains, as to how I break down problems and analyze them to figure out, okay, how am I going to tackle this problem, and do I necessarily have the tools to tackle to tackle it from from this particular domain. Hmm. And uh, you don't necessarily always have to tackle a problem from within the same domain itself. Like I said, like using things from the relationships domain to say that if a player is having performance issues, but you yourself, you're not a trained sports psychologist, right? You hmm. can't, uh, you can help them out as a coach, but in terms of like, helping them overcome their negative self-talk and things like that, maybe you're not the right person to do that. So what can you leverage on, right? You can attack, you can attack it from a knowledge perspective where you help them uh, bolster their confidence by giving them a, a flow chart, right? A direct flow chart. And then right. uh, you give them a cheat sheet that they bring bring with them on, on stage or whatsoever, right? So that even if they're having doubts or whatsoever, they can refer back to the cheat sheet to help them out with the game itself. You can uh, solve it from the relationships domain where you then um, leverage their relationships with their uh, friends, with their support network outside, outside of the game. To find, uh, to help them find the courage, to help them find that uh, sense of confidence, to help them out solve whatever slump that they, they might be in. Or within the systems approach is about helping them structure to say, okay, let, let's review this, and every time uh, mm -hmm. you're encountering this, right, I, I want you to sound off, or this is the thing that I'll be tracking throughout uh, throughout the weeks and things like that, so that we're trying to tackle the problem at hand, right? So it's a lot about isolating issues and then uh, trying to creatively come up with solutions towards it. And the systems aspect of it is about understanding and compartmentalizing the possible solutions to the possible problem. All right, exactly. Yeah, so I really like it, you know, that you have such a clear structure in your mind that you can always, you know, it's 
evident based on the way you talk you know you just have like these boxes or you know these domains basically they're like okay i first check each domain where is do i feel or think you know it's the most um you know prevalent or the most interesting part in terms of uh helping a player right where does the problem reside or where can i potentially solve this issue in which domain am i you know having all the tools or uh things you know, in my toolbox to fix it, or do, do I need to call help, or do I need to, you know, call friends? Do I need to call a uh, sport psychologist? Do I need to go over the systems again? I think that is, you know, so um, very, you know, uh, just just like it's the whole topic of the podcast, but you know, so stru structured and systemized that it takes you literally no effort. Uh, in a positive sense, to go through every single thing to basically check the whole performance, you know, uh, plethora or uh, how do you call that? Like all aspects, basically, because you have it all thought about. Basically, like a huge mind map, it's all there. It's all structured and everything like that. So when talking about like these domains, like you have the in-game system, performance domain, you talked also about relationships and you know, you, you also touched about the systems. So, all right. So now people have an idea what systems are. You describe it. How can coaches create their own systems or what will be a good starting point to create your own systems? Because I believe everyone has a plan or some sort of systems, at least from my perspective, but not as uh, meticulous or detailed as you basically are talking about. How can you okay. start off with, you know, designing your own systems, you know, in terms of that? Okay, so this is where a little bit of the engineering training will come into play, right? There's this right. Uh, portion of engineering training where we call it uh, technology management, where we talk about um, how intuitive is a piece of design and, and what's the, the language we use in terms of managing our technology and managing right. uh, or, or managing information, right? Where it's, so there's two elements of this. There's what we call implicit knowledge. Uh, it is what is said to be assumed to be understood, right? right? Or it is by a particular group of people. So within a particular group of people, like you talk to computer programmers, right? They have their own jargon and all that kind of things. They will have difficulty communicating with other with another group of people who aren't familiar with the coding aspects of things, where they don't, uh, where they aren't familiar with their with their um, implicit knowledge. Because right. they're going to speak in a bunch of jargon and the other people aren't necessarily going to understand it. So I would say the first step of uh, people helping them out with systems is to realize, firstly, realize that you already, you're probably at this point of time in life, you probably have some systems in place, right? Be it from your daily routine to how you have the problems or whatsoever. And you have certain uh, natural responses that seem instinctual to you and that will be what i would say constitutes your uh implicit knowledge right some people try to exactly. define that as talent but i just say that that's your implicit knowledge the mm -hmm. first step is to uh what i always do uh when when i'm giving it's actually very interesting because i i completely wholesale borrowed this exercise from from, from uh one of the the challenges we were, we were tasked to do when i was 13 years old in school it's how <laughs> okay, do you write go. how do you write a recipe on how to make popcorn right Mm. And to make this challenging, even more challenging, is you are writing it for an alien. So how do you write a recipe of how to make a bag of popcorn for, wow. for an alien, right? Assuming that the alien can understand English or they can use whatever translation software to translate from English into whatever language that they have. So a lot of the intuitive things, like opening the bag, right? Yeah, and it goes so out, of the way, out of the yeah, window the, immediately. The, the teacher would do very hilarious things, right? Like without opening the bag of, bag of popcorn, you start trying to pour the popcorn kernels into the pot itself. And of course, nothing mm. will come out, right? So a lot of this implicit information is what's missing. And it's about how do you decode this implicit information into something that's written out in an explicit set of instructions for people. Right. Wow. So guys, so guys, stop stop this video or podcast right now. Grab a pen and paper and start to write the recipe for popcorn and understand <laughs> what it takes to write write a system. Um, like it, it's so fascinating, man. It's so fun. I I I really literally love this. Like it, it's so like you need to use pictures or like flowcharts or make it visual or handling or demonstrating it or like. 
like how do you do this like how would it look like uh i mean okay at the end of the day what your your output is that there, there's a few there's a few forms of systems that they can have right it can be a recipe style system which is what we talked about right mm. how do you handle a particular scenario right it's a recipe that you follow this can also be used in the in-game scenario right when we have baron nasher step zero step one push out the top lane step two reset right step three run mid together as five people step four flash the opponents out of the bot side jungle step five kill three range minions on the bot side wave so that the wave sinks right with the mid mid wave step six have a synced wave push between mid and bot right and then step seven is the collapse on the side that they have less players on because now you have pushed into waves at the same time and you have the shorter rotation path mm. so that's kind of uh you can break things down into recipes that's a form of system in itself and you can have something that's a little bit more dynamic which is a full flow chart or even uh, what I call a decision making matrix, right? So these are these are a few big tools, right? Where it's um in the flow chart is is the is the whole if X therefore Y in yeah. decision matrices matrices they'll be like okay condition A condition B condition one condition two. If it's A one, this is the response. If it's B one, this is the response. Uh, you you can picture the boxes in your head. Yeah. And that's that's kind of how uh those are ways that you can write out and and design systems. But why I always use the pop point example as a thing is that the the first thing that you have to do is understand that you don't necessarily operate on the wavelength as everybody else. And the first way is to realize that these are the systems that you're already using in your life, and uh it's just about finding ways to express them out as well and a lot of times it's not necessarily as a coach that you are coming in and prescribing all the systems right a lot of times it's also helping players understand that these are the things that they already have been using to help them succeed and it's just helping them translate that implicit knowledge into an explicit set of knowledge so that their teammates can then get on the same page as them and then they can function together as a team yeah i think that is a huge right because i see so many teams um, struggling with communication or like not getting aligned because they don't make the information explicit, right? They have really hard time um, expressing what they want and how they exactly want to do it and how to convey that message to other team members or the coach having sometimes difficulty, you know, expressing that in such, you know, step-by-step, you know, recipe type of way um, that it takes a pretty long time before everyone understands what it is right? What needs to be done. Um, so I believe you gave some amazing examples with the matrix and also the recipe with the alien metaphor, um, to really start to think and build your own systems, right? Um, yeah, that's, that's great. Like you have these two systems, right? Or like two, two examples that you gave, do you have like a favorite system? What is your go-to, like, what is the one thing if you are working with a team that's like, ah, this gets me excited every single time because I can use this. Like this, this is this is your fun. Well, I mean, I, I would say my, the most fun is uh, <laughs> my my magnum opus would be what I call the the number system that I use to teach teams of how to play this two lane numbers advantage style that I teach in League of Legends. I don't really have mm. a clear way to explain it, but uh, the simple input is by looking at the status of the side lane waves, right? The secondary okay. input is uh, then understanding what kind of team composition you're playing. And then the output of that would be to know what the deployment on the map accordingly, based on that, right? At the time, you can't even skip the secondary input. It's just by simply looking at what's the position of the side lane waves, how am I going to play the map accordingly, right? And mm. then that determines the output. Yeah, so so like the, disregarding the champions, the picks, or whatever... It's really about the side lanes having such a basic understanding, and that makes you a- be able to make decisions across the map. Yep, it's uh, what I I'm kind of infamous for. I say it's a bunch of Jensenisms, right? Where I always tell my <laughs> players, right? Okay, laning phase is fake, itemization is itemization is a lie, and draft doesn't matter, right? The only thing that matters is how we. Oh, you the you game. go tell that to LS then. Yes, it's the, it's the complete opposite of everything that he says. That's, that's a, I mean, what what he does is uh, in, on, in, in his shows is an, it's a different model of the game, right? Right, where, exactly. Where uh, once again, like, like I said, there's three different ways of modeling the game at, at the moment, and I'll say that uh, there's the farm efficiency way of modeling the game, where what else says is very important, right? Because it's about how do I win a five v five team fight 
by having the most efficient set of items or the most efficient in inverted commas team composition gold wise right yeah so in terms of like you have to be efficient when you spend your gold you have to itemize correctly you have to draft compositions that are effective at taking those 5v5 team fights but mm. uh a lot of the way that i teach the game uh it's not about winning um 5v5 fight hate on it's about uh the i would say what's the axiomatic truth of the game is that if i bring five players to a fight and you bring four i will win the fight right yeah likewise yeah. if i have four players and you have three i will win the fight yeah. and that is kind of the, it's a different premise altogether in which how we construct the game so there's different ways that different coaches can um or different systems in which people con conceptualize the game right and of course that's the the most recent one jdg where it's not about either one it's about who has flash and who doesn't have flash when we approach the mid lane fight right if i mm. flash and you have and you don't i'm going to win the fight right of course that's a little bit of an of a oversimplification or exaggeration but you have to realize that there's these different models of the game that exist out there different teams subscribe to these models differently and one of the the mistakes that a lot of coaches make very early on is that they will always say that oh, my system is the best my conceptualization of the, of the game is the best and everybody else right. is, is is dumb slash stupid or they have no idea what they're doing but it's only when you can appreciate what these systems are trying to achieve that's when you can go to the next level and you can understand that these are the tactics that can be applied if i am approaching this game as a team with this philosophy playing against this other team with that type of philosophy it's something that right. T1 understood really well when they play against Gen.G and MSI. Uh, and it's something that they tried to adapt to when they play against JDG, but they did not successfully do that enough. Yeah, so it's really about what you're saying is respecting your own philosophy and also respecting the other philosophy so you can adapt and, you know, find the flaws. Um, would you also, though, like, I think that's a, a question that maybe some listeners have right now. Like, of course, you have your own preference in terms of system. Do you see more like patterns in terms of like consistent, quote unquote, success with one approach or the other? Like for me, I'm more on your side personally, looking and thinking about things because the way you provide systems, it's uh, structured. So it has like guidelines. However, it is still dynamic. So it has a lot of flexibility, how you can implement it, how you can change it, whatever. So like one item or like, 200 gold difference like on the item doesn't really matter that much if you play the system correctly. Others are like more rigid and more like fixed and objectively correct. Like that's how I, for example, see uh, CLS, right? It, it uh, has less dynamics in terms of like interpersonal relationships and how the team is playing, personalities, play styles, whatever. Uh, that's how I view it. But uh, uh, again, the question is, do you see you know, some more coach approaches be more prevalent or be more successful for, from your, you know, experience going through all of these regions? Well, um, I would say it really depends on where you are, what the organization's expectations are like, and what is your, what have you been tasked to do as a coach? So over the last two years, um, I haven't had a lot of gold uh, next to my name on Wikipedia because I've been taking on very developmental projects uh, in the collegiate space. The idea was to be about how can we develop this as a pipeline to pro in NA. Mm. At least that was a very big goal on my part. And uh, other models, I uh, was working with the academy team, and a big part of that was about how do I develop players? How do I help them work on the weaknesses to become better players overall which should be right. very different from when you are working uh on a team where we say that okay we are trying to win this championship in three months we're trying to win the championship in yeah. three months it's a different timeline it's a different set of expectations and it's a different uh slightly different approach in which you would take so the thing about um the rigidity of your systems which is i had uh i would say that even though you said that there's a certain degree of flexibility towards it my approach to teaching the game uh when i was working on develop more development projects was less collaborative but more prescribed right where it's about helping forcing the game forcing the players to play the game in a more difficult way so that they can understand this aspect of map control within league of legends itself and mm. uh one of the players that worked with for maryville apa is he's now able to go on and play for the team liquid uh challengers team and he's there he's shot calling for the veterans on the team right He's able to shock off four other veterans in the team because he has been exposed to that. I mean, of course, I'm not going to discount his initial disposition to being um, a map player, archetype of player in the first place. But I would have to say that with the exposure of my systems, it, it gives him the, the confidence to be able to assess the scenarios, even though their in-game system is uh, different from what I thought at the end of the day. 
right? It's just about priming them to think about, okay, this game, you think about it, mm. not so much uh, uh, in terms of wave states, in terms of what's the position on the map, we're playing for map control at the end of the day. Uh, it builds that structure for them. But in the meantime, because we're playing this higher level of execution style, we weren't able to win the championship within that year itself, right? Whereas if you're right. just trying to win the championship, uh, the very cynical way to do it would be to, uh, the, the football equivalent would be uh, parking the bus, right? You score one goal and then you park the bus. Who cares about your free-flowing tiki-taka football? Um, it's just about you win and you win ugly, right? So yeah. we, we learn how to win pretty. We, we learn how to win in like the, the inverted commas the correct way based on what I believe of how to play League of Legends. We were able to execute under vision and the players learned a lot and they developed a lot under that. But the, the trade-off, of course, is that uh, when it comes to winning ugly, it's like, okay, we are going to pick Orn, Orianna, and Jinx and then we're going to ask our opponents, do you know how to assemble a plan to attack that? We know, but do you, right? And then make it so that the opponents now have to be the ones to, to crack the code. Um, Mm. We, we we didn't spend enough time or we didn't have the the i, I wouldn't want to say cynicism right but i wouldn't say that but i say that that we didn't have the we didn't have that as part of the plan so i would say that's a learning portion of uh of coaching as well where it's a little bit about the period about the periodization plan and how you approach these sort of things as well right it's a little bit too ambitious to say that i'm, I'm going to system so good that my floor is going to be above your ceiling regardless right no, i can even sure. raise the floor really high but why not just have the players play towards the ceiling by accounting for the comfort and all of these things as well. So, um, mm. sorry, I've lost track of what the original question was. It was about uh, systems being... Um, what was it again? <laughs> so, uh, well, pff, uh, I don't care about the, the question. It, uh, <laughs> I, for, I forgot as well, to be, uh, to be honest. Like, But it, it felt like an answer. So, uh, um, I, I would say, like, Right, uh, so it's not like the way to go, or maybe you know, not the holy grail of everything. Right, that's what you're saying. You rely also like on how it matches with the uh, uh, with the player or like the situation. There's so many constraints, right? That that can make it good or either you know optimal or suboptimal, and how much time you have. Would you then say like if you were paired with someone with LS, like could you be very um, complementary to each other, or would you say like oh we're gonna have a lot of friction and and challenges or do you see a world where if you had an assistant coach or an you know an other coach besides you who brings in you know that other perspective or this other coaching style would that be the perfect cocktail or would you say like well that will be different because xyz okay i i would say that there's a few ways to um tackle this right i think it's a lot about setting expectations about getting everybody on the same page so if I were to if if I were to hire somebody who subscribes very strongly to Elvis, Elvis's um involvement mm -hmm. with the game, it would be very difficult for me to work with him unless okay. you were willing to meet me in between, right? Okay. Because I, I have a certain things I want to achieve. And of course at the end of the day it's um what what I said, right? It's about understanding what the overall goals of the program are and it's about being able to communicate that with the rest of the with everybody. So this is an experience that I've had before where uh, people are saying, where I'm there saying, okay, we're doing this for development. I'm not going to have my players play their strongest and more com most comfortable champions all the time because I want to push them and I want them to develop in these areas, right? And in right. esports, it's very easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day emotions, especially for newer and younger coaches. And so they can say, oh, we're losing, the players are sad, I'm feeling bad and everything. And it's very yeah. easy to throw in the towel and say, okay, you know what? Back to the Orn, back to the Oriana, back to the Jinx. We're just going to play for scaling. All these ideas about learning and development, let's throw it out the window. Because yeah, because we want to now. have the dopamine boost. We want to feel useful. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, because the immediate pain of losing now is, is too much to bear. And... and Especially if, if they if they subscribe to a to model that that's counterproductive to mine, then that's where uh, we can have issues because then that's where they yeah. start doubting, and then that's where we can have some uh, some challenges. But if it's going to be the other way around, where it's about how do I provide structure, how do I help codify these cell things into a more standard operating procedure for a team that wants to say, hey, okay, we are just building for performance. We are building for something where it's about we are, we know that we're not going to be the better team. We know that we cannot outplay the this. The, this team with these tactics on the map. How can we put ourselves in the best possible scenario to, have to maximize our chances of winning? And sometimes that's the that's the scaling approach, right? 
Mm. You hit them with unconventional killing pick in the support position that can win lane, dominate dominate the lane from that point, and then you see where you can go with that, which is what I did with EVOS in 2018 when we had to play against Team Liquid. Uh, where we played Astro Tarek. Tarek wasn't even in, in the meta at that point of time, and we were able to take a game off uh, Team Liquid at MSI during the group stage itself. With a, with a team that was like one tenth of the budget or something, so um, yeah, yeah. It, it's not to say that it would be impossible, but it's about like understanding what the dynamic is, and it's about pairing people in those uh, scenarios accordingly, right? Because if I'm right. if I'm here, I'm trying to execute on my three year plan and my five year plan, and I'm going to have somebody in there who is uh, who is not being very reasonable accommodating to, to my plans that's going to be tough um it's going to be a challenge but if it's going to be the other way around and okay it's like hey we're working towards something that's more shorter term and things like that then um yeah it's a uh, it's something that i've done before in the past it's something that i'm i'm willing to do as well so it's not to say that i'm completely rejecting those ideas because i i do know that if you have to fight fires on the team, which I've done uh, a few mm. times, that is the best way to win, right? You go in there, you help them fix, shore up some issues in their laning phase, you help the, the players uh, come up with a very clear style of, like, this is how you don't lose a game, so that they're able to have the, the correct defensive answers to defensive responses to whatever that's happening on the map. You park the bus accordingly, mm. you have one set piece, and you score from the one corner kick, right? Yeah. It's so boring as hell. Greece still won the Euro, right? Yeah. Greece, you won the Euro that year. You cannot take that away from them, right? Yeah, they won. Maybe not in the prettiest way, but but they they won it. exactly. So uh, also like um, the the last thing, right? Uh, it's interesting that you say uh, what you're saying about like the different coaching styles, or like you have to compromise, etc. Because in the amateur, semi-professional. Uh, like leagues, right? In League of Legends, but also in other games, they usually hire an analyst or an assistant coach that is like complementary, what I say, right? Oh, you know, I have his assistant coach because he's more on the game knowledge side, right? It's really black and white in that sense, usually. <clears throat> that is like the, the tendons uh, that I see. But then uh, either one of the coaching styles, either it's more game knowledge focused or either more relationship focused or system focused. And it usually uh, can bring a lot of friction. So I believe that's a really great point of value for you know people that are listening. Like you have to compromise or really understand what are you here for, right? Who are you bringing in? Because it's not only like, oh, I bring in systems and... You know, this other uh, assistant coach brings in all the game knowledge and all the objective stuff, etc. And he's going to do that. Else you have like conflicting interests or maybe a different type of uh, approach uh, in terms of, um, you know, the whole play style. And then, you know, also when it evolves further, it's all about trust, right? It's what you hear with, with teams. Like first you have to buy in, s sell, you know, sell the approach, maybe sell the dream or, or you know, what, what you can achieve. And then it's all about trust, right? Making sure you you, you feed that. Um, so, yeah, I, I want to uh, change a little bit of like, not, not really change the direction, but you also mentioned um, like NA and you wanted to go into the collegiate scene. Um, what what do you have to say about that in terms of like why do you want to work so much or at least I, I see the enthusiasm or I hear that in a collegiate scene you want to develop talent why does it attract you so much compared to maybe all of the other regions you've been through why NA why collegiate so I think this is a little bit of a sensitive topic because it has to do with a little bit about culture right and mm -hmm. what is the culture of esports mm -hmm. in this place as well attitudes towards these style things in the various countries and various regions in all the in the major asia countries they have a very clear b system in korea they've always had the history of having the b houses for starcraft but you were going at somebody made you paying them or they paying you minimum or whatsoever and then you'll be able to train in a combat semi-competitive environment right right uh in china they have their training partner system where the moment you hit a thousand points on on the ladder they'll fly you in they'll trial you for a month and then if you pass the trail you'll become a training partner on the team right you're not an official player yet but you're somebody who now lives and, and uh lives and navigates a team environment where you're receiving feedback from coaches and all the style of things in europe it's a little bit different because um 
players from young, they are exposed to team sports, they're exposed to team activity, they're exposed to team competition in all sorts of different areas, right? I, right. I, it's a very common experience in Europe to say that, to hear the players say, to say that, oh, I used to play football for my village. I used yeah. to do hockey or, or swimming or, or whatsoever, depending on the, the country that they came from. Yeah, Whereas true. in America, a lot of these players, they go straight from solo queue. They don't necessarily have any sports or team background or the sports background that they have isn't necessarily the most well-tuned to help them uh, navigate an, an esports team environment. And okay. uh, that's one of the big challenges in terms of transitioning players from um, from amateur to pro. So there isn't necessarily the bridge. And while well, in the past there was the academy system that later on became the challenges league system, uh, the the unfortunate reality was that a lot of times this was not an actual developmental space, but it was a form of redundancy for the LCS teams. It was then yeah. branded as a developmental space, right? Which is why they required it to be in LA, which is why they required it to have all, all these restrictions as well. At least this is me as an observer commenting on it um, as as an as an outsider. Yeah. Right. Okay. And I experienced that a little bit as well, where a lot of the motivation of my players wasn't necessarily about how do I get better, do how do I become a better player in the long run, but how do I perform well enough so that I can get picked up by a team and play in the LCS in the next split or even the next week. So uh, when you're working with those sort of expectations and time frames, it becomes a lot more challenging, it becomes a lot more difficult. And then you have to play second fiddle to whatever the head coach of the LCS is saying to say that, okay, this is what I think you need to work on in order to get a starting spot in the LCS. And then uh, you have to facilitate that as well, rather than executing on the longer term plan that you've developed. So collegiate is a very naturally, I would say it's a culturally um, a uh, flush solution mm. to what already exists in any because there's all these structures within sports and all the kind of things for people to be predisposed to um, seeing collegiate as a good space to develop as an athlete or as a as an esports right. competitor so so i actually felt that uh and not only did they have that right in terms of all these external support the lower tier the lower down the tiers that you go you find that the less and less support that you have right and the number of things that are outside of your scope your ability to handle these sort of things as well also uh greatly diminishes when i'm working in asia things like mental health support and things like that it just doesn't exist Right. The yeah. idea of supporting mental health is that they will ask a friend who's a trained counselor, psychiatrist, or whatsoever. They come and talk to your player once, and then they'll offer the player the chance to have a follow up with them. Right. They won't even enforce it, and then that's it. Right. Yeah. And uh, Very what I was told, what, what I was told, the time that the greatest, the greatest mercy you can show a player who's struggling with mental health issues is to is to just let them go. Right. So it's a, it's a very different um, place altogether. Well, but I mean, even also a culture, right? You look at the, the Division Two, the Division Three teams that that are in, in NA. There's no formal structure. There's no formal support that can help them out, right? How do you help players understand that this is how you take care of your body? This is how you work on your ergonomics. This is how you mm-hmm. live a more balanced and responsible life, right? Uh, as much as people talk about uh, the insane work ethic and work schedule of the, the players in Asia, there's something that they have developed over time there as well. It's about how do you navigate as a th- how do you navigate a team environment as a player, and how how and help them understand what does it mean to have a career in esports, right? This right. is a job. And so I it goes from gaming to really professional, and that's a big big gap, basically. Yeah, and co- collegiate is a perfect place to do that, right? It lowers yeah. the stakes a little bit, but it's still significant. And at the same time, your pool of resources to work with as staff and things like that, you can lean on university resources, be it for money, be it for facilities, be it for uh, all these other av- easily available things on campuses. And at the same time, it also gives you what I would say, it's a much different space for learning and development, right? So uh, one of the things that we talk about in, in coaching or teaching is cognitive load theory. How much can somebody absorb within a day itself when it yep. comes to the same topic? And it goes back to what you were saying is that do you necessarily need to be screaming 16 hours a day to become the best there in the world? Uh, perhaps mm-hmm. when you're trying to peak, uh, there's different arguments for this, right? But I, I would say that sure. a lot of people would definitely agree. It's like, okay, if you're going for a tournament itself, at least one month, two months out from it, you definitely need to increase the amount of load that you have. But you don't have to be playing 16 hours a day, seven days a week for uh, 365 days a year, right? Yeah. 
and that's the that's one of the things that I think Kaliya is uh, pretty good for is that it provides a um, form of active recovery of sorts, right? So once again, untrained person, no solid science behind this, and I would just, I will have to say that active recovery is also a rather uh, modern topic in the field of sports sports performance, where mm. players like after finishing a soccer game, right? Instead of in the past they would do like massages and ice baths and things like that, but these days people are doing like um, bike runs or uh, or slow jogs, right? Or ten kilometer jogs after after a soccer game yeah. as a form of active recovery as well to help reduce the amount of lactic acid buildup or, or whatsoever, right? So is there an equivalent of that in the esports space where we talk about cognitive load, where you are being so desensitized to the amount of training that you have? What can you do to break the routine to to vary up the performance, to vary up the training that you have? Do you give them a bigger breath of things that they're looking at, really bigger breath of things that they're doing, so that whenever they get back to the game, they're fresh, they're ready to go, and they're excited, right, to play the game. And I think mm. the collegiate and actively doing class at the same time, people always said, oh, it's, it's, it actually makes it more difficult for them. I would say that at the developmental level, it's actually even better for them. Because yeah. my experience working To in break up teams, the patterns. Yes, right, is that once you, you finish one month, you finish two months, you're done learning my system, right? And then now it's about finding the discipline to, to execute on a regular basis. And then the, the mistakes you're making is less and less, but you will feel that, okay, it's the same one or two mistakes that you keep ma making over there. It can, you can feel stuck. The ability mm -hmm. to go, go to class, learn about thermodynamics or whatever, if you're doing engineering, learn about database structures and uh, uh, SQL and things like that and, and computer programming, or even do do like some business management calls about IP management, IP law or something, and then come back and talk about, okay, this is how T1 plays the game. This is how BLG plays the game. This is how JDG plays the game, mm. right? I would say it's a, it helps increase engagement level and it also helps increase your, inform uh, your information retention as well because now there's actually other things that's happening outside of it that your brain actually just draws these associations as well right, right. because you like, you created the you you set the stage in order to absorb it in a way yeah like even if even if they have a test on the same day and they they, they flunk a test or whatsoever and then on the same day you cover the particular macro concept they will now recall that they flunked the test on the day that they learned this concept right yeah, yeah. and it increases the retention value of the concept as compared to when you're just doing day in day out you wake up you show up you show up for scrims you finish scrims you go home you play solo queue and then you go to bed and then the next day you wake up and you do it again right yeah. so once again non uh this is all Conjecture, pseudoscience at best, right? So don't. Uh, <laughs> I, I, if, if you want to cite me on this, go ahead. You know. I, I think <laughs> I, I think you're very very humble in that regard, right? Um, it doesn't always like for for me, right? Uh, I I'm more on 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 the same side of you. You know, I use uh, in my research. I have you know some background into coaching, into teaching, and everything. Uh, but over the years, you. Like not always having uh, a degree in something qualifies someone to be excellent at his job or to say something, right? It's also the degree of passion and how to go into, um, you know, some specifics or topics and really be engaged with it rather than just sit back like, oh, I got my degree. So now I'm the only person who can say something about it, right? You, you use rational thinking, you implement those things, you, you quote those things. So I think you, you know... Uh, yeah, it's more than, you know, okay, uh, the, the way you describe things. And I think you can formulate a pretty well-structured answer uh, to paint a picture or, you know, what are uh, the dynamics of like a collegiate program. Um, so, you know, the the, uh, the question was like, hey, why collegiate? Why is it like something like for me, from what I hear reading between the lines is um, you really like to work with you know uh players or give them more opportunities by implementing systems really elevating the scene and have also in a sense a challenge right because uh, other regions are maybe ahead in terms of like the development that you feel like hey this is a challenge where i can provide my value my usb my systems my uh structure can really elevate and you know bring an a collegiate in a sense, like towards a next level, like I can help these players thrive, become better humans besides becoming better players as well by doing all of these things that you've just mentioned. Is that a sort of like uh, a summary of what you were saying uh, or how would you 
rephrase it or correct me if I'm yeah, I mean, missing definitely. something. Definitely, I think that at the end of the day, that's what I wanted to do, right? Uh, um, day nine is a very big inspiration of mine, and uh, I think one of uh, his taglines was be-, "Be a better gamer, be a better person." Right? Who 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 is who? Uh, sorry, sorry. Who, who was your Sean uh... Bot, Day nine. He used to be this very famous commentator for StarCraft two. Ah, okay, yeah. Right. Okay, so I have a... never heard of it, so that's why, like, hey, do I know this? Like, okay. So uh, that's something that I've always believed in. Uh, when I was making the choice to pursue engineering as a career, I pursue esports as a career. I chose esports because I felt that I could service the industry in this way, where I could bring uh, this perspective into this area. Right? How can I help people get financial education? How can I help people once again? Going back to the implicit and explicit things, right? Right. Decode the implicit skills, the implicit learning structures that they have. For you to hit challenger in League of Legends, you are not. You have a very strong learning capacity. Right, you have a very strong intuition for learning. You have a very strong intuition for problem solving. You do not luck by luck become a challenger player. <laughs> right, Oops, you do not just sit in front of a computer, play twenty thousand hours, and then without picking up any skills, without getting any, uh, ha- without having any ability at all, be able to hit challenger. And that is what I wanted to to to, to do. I've always believed that th- it's always been my hypothesis of sorts. Right, that people who are good at games also tend to be really good at problem solving to be pretty good in STEM fields, or even, say, doing research as a whole. Hmm. So uh, the, the ability to go in there and help students say that, okay, uh, in, in, in this space, or help esports athletes uh, be in this space to then translate the skills back into other elements, right? So that they can be good at in, in other areas of life, and it creates a safety net for them themselves as well. Because at the moment, in pro esports, it only benefits the top 0.001%, right? Anything below that, you don't really get much. But that shouldn't yeah. be the case, right? My my dream of the future is where if not even challenger, you are a platinum player of League of Legends. And that's something you can put on a resume when you submit when you yeah. submit a job application. And people say, Okay, well, you're a platinum player in League of Legends. You're the top five yeah. percent of all League of Legends players. That's actually pretty darn impressive. Right? Yeah. Exactly. In any other field in life, if you were top 5% of, of something, you're pretty much an expert, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it, it really is big. So what would you say, like comparing to what you're seeing? Because to me, it also feels like you feel the urgency to really help and jump in. What needs to change? Like, of course, you bring the change, of course, Jensen. You bring the change with the structures and systems. Uh, what else needs to change, or is it only the structure systems? Or if you had to, you know, had a wave a magic wand, and you have to change some or remove some things, so one or two in a collegiate scene or in an A, what would you change? Um, I can't go too much into it because it has uh, some of the things to do with my with my previous employer, employer Merville. So I'm gonna answer this in a in a slightly different way. Right, where answer I, it in the best way you can. <laughs> where um, let let me think of how to phrase this without um talking about my disagreements with my with my previous employer, mm-hmm. uh, too much. But the key idea is that I think that these programs need to be more forward looking. And uh, right now, for all of these collegiate programs, they are trying to convince their uh, their management or their directorship or whatever board that they're, that they're pitching to that this is a good marketing exercise or whatever premise that there is. So a lot of these things are directly tied to its results, right? Mm. Whereas uh, if I could change the magic wand, I would hope that uh, people see what esports can do on a student life level uh, and on an academics level where I would wish for a strong marketing campaign that would convince director level, board level people in collegiate programs to help see that um, these are the benefits and this is how we can utilize the amount of games that students are playing on a regular basis to engage uh, them on a student life level, to help them get better academics, to help them become better problem solvers and equip them Mm. better for society. Right. right. On top of the, the, the whole, science like, is already a research, and from what I've seen, is positive. Like, uh, you know, standing behind your argument, like uh, esports programs and everything, it it um, 
has a higher, you know, student retention, has better results, you know, uh, uh, less uh, lesser dropouts, etc. And that is worth something, right? Especially in in NA when you're talking about high collegiate amounts of money, right? For it's life changing for for many uh, these esports programs. So, you know, well, I, I'm living like in in the Netherlands, right? In Europe, and we or I and but we with like. Um, and the people I talk to, right, in Europe, uh, we always look at, like, NA, it's like, oh, it's like five to ten years ahead in terms of the collegiate scene. But we have to remind ourselves, like, uh, it's it's better, but it can be so much more better, right, in terms of retention and everything. So, yeah, I, I, I like that a lot. And, you know, I can see that a lot that, you know, it's more like a marketing plug for collegiates, you know, to attract students and, you know, it's just like a money-making machine. But at the end of the day, it's about changing lives. And hopefully we can see that more uh, in terms of like more programs in NA, but basically across the globe to provide those opportunities. Um, so besides this, right, do you also see things where, right, um, in terms of like coaches of these programs, uh, what would they need in terms of like to more facilitate into that? Is it like more thinking like you or what would you say coaches in similar programs or similar positions like yourself should do? Uh, I can't speak much as to what they should do, but what I can hope for once or again, want to do. <laughs> what, what, once again, going back to the magic one thing, I hope that they can gain some perspective. Um, I hope that they can realize that they have to be, that they are meant to be educators and um, be less caught up in the glitz and glamour, right, of running an esports program and, and being a director mm. and focus more on like, okay, this is where we want to be three years down the road. This is where we want to be five years down the road. This is why I want my program to stand for. These are the values that I want to instill in them. Um, I think it's very easy for people to get caught up. I mean, it's not just at the collegiate level, but even at, at the pro level, right? Especially right. for a lot of the younger coaches and directors out there. The, the trap is to try to be friends with them, to get too close to them. Well, it is important to have a strong relationship with them. Um, know very clearly that you are here in a position to achieve a goal with these people, right? Mm. And that you have to be willing to make the hard, hard decisions and hard choices at times. Right. So it's not all, all, all about like sunshines and rainbows, like, oh, finally, we got an esports program. I'm the director. Let's make friends or make it the best gaming club you know, uh, of the state, something like that, but really have, you know, an overarching ambition. That's what I hear you say of like, hey, we need to look into the future. Uh, let's make it wor worth our time, uh, all the money, right? That we can really elevate it in like the three to five years, right? Um, so in terms of like uh, NA and also like this development, you also like painted some differences in these other regions. Um, is there any particular region besides NA, right? You want to work in NA because, you know, you find this a challenge and you really can provide value in that sense. If you have to choose between like the other region, Europe, Asia, Australia, where would you choose or pick? Or maybe you would go to South America because <laughs> you can still go there. <laughs> Come to Brazil? <laughs> yeah, have some crazy ass fans. <laughs> I mean, it's a. Uh, I'll go to wherever aligns with my vision, right? So if anybody can can come to me and say, "Hey, this is what we're trying to achieve," and I think this aligns strongly with my vision, is about servicing youth, about using esports as a force for good, as a as a force to change the world for the better. Hmm. Uh, I'll be willing to contribute my services towards that, right? Right, and um, that's the main thing that I'm looking for. Be it as you know, capacity as a coach, but capacity as a whatever it is, you know. But at this point of time, I'm looking back at it. I've been coaching for six years, seven years. I, I thought I'd be doing collegiate for for five years in total, but uh, things didn't work out. So I, I'm at a point where I'm reevaluating things at this point of time. So I'm definitely mm. open open to things. So if you're out there, you listen to this and say, "Hey, I like what this guy's saying." Um, do reach out to me and then we we can see what we what we can make work. Yeah. So like um in order to help you, right? Because I think you know they they listen to the whole podcast and, and 
you know, for me speaking, I think like, oh, this guy is onto something, you know, with the structure systems, his way of, uh, you know, speaking, he has some good ideas, right? You just mentioned like, what are these, these values, right? Maybe to go into that a little bit more, uh, what type of program, team, organization, what kind of values do they need to need to bring? What do you feel like, okay, this is where you best fit and similar coaches like me would perfectly fit? What kind of values are you th- are you talking about? How should that, that atmosphere uh, welcome you or value you, etc.? cetera? Um, I think this is, uh, it's hard for me to put it out that way, right? Because it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, I'm somebody who has adapted to so many scenarios, but at the end of the day, there's a very large overarching set of values that I can be looking at, right? But it's pretty much, uh, as long as you're not somebody who's out there like creating a shell agency to just exploit players and things like that, mm. I'd be happy to work with a lot of structures, a lot of systems. Be it as someone who says that okay, we're trying to be the most competitive team out there, or, or be it as an organization or collegiate program that's about development, that's about nurturing youth, it's about helping people develop. It's a lot about outreach towards uh, and growing esports as a whole, right? Mm. Um, integrity, things like that, that's definitely a must. But it's um, it's hard to say exactly. Like, what is the, the one thing that I align with the most? Because I've just been to so many places, I kind of become a chameleon. Uh, mm. where I'm just forced to adapt and say, okay, this is what you're going to achieve. This is how I can best achieve that with you. And um, the only thing I ask for is uh, transparency and honesty in the conversation when, when we have it. And you're coming for and say, okay, this is what I want to achieve. And uh, once again, make sure that the actions follow up with the words, right? Right. So I, I think it, it's a good turnaround, right? Because I ask like, okay, what values do they need to have? But actually... It, it, you don't matter what kind of sort of values they have, but you have to understand what your values are. You know, I hear transparency, honesty, integrity, you know, like in terms of like to get at least the ball going or to have a conversation, right? You have to be a fair, uh, you know, have to be clear on, on what they want and they understand and, in you know, uh, be honest about what they want and can offer and they can, cannot offer. And if that then aligns, then you can find a match, right? So I think that that sounds, you know, more than reasonable. And this comes maybe back to what you were saying, like common sense is not all that common. That's why I ask, right? Because if you don't understand your own values and value, then it's really hard to match. Then you go to any conversation, then you go to any organization, any program, and then you have like six months or maybe a year of experience basically didn't learn anything because it didn't align. You you cannot express who you are. So that's why I think it's important to understand what your values are, what you stand for, what you have to bring and how that aligns. Because even though you know you have a lot to bring and you're enthusiastic for everyone just to pick you up, then you, you know, you all open yourself up also for, you know, quote unquote waste of time or you know anything and you'll be maybe in six months still at the same place looking for someone that wants to pick you up um so yeah um uh l- let me just uh, take a look man so in terms of like coach development right so you have all these systems and everything how do you see yourself still improving right when i listen to you you have you know some decent you know pretty good understanding of you know you got your um systems your domains uh you got some good understanding about uh you know psychology at least like the the basics you know you're very humble about that um how do you see yourself going you know going into the future because i see you as a coach that wants to stay here for you know many years to come how do you stay on your a game how do you keep developing and still innovating yourself um, I mean, it's a lot about taking on new challenges, looking at uh, what the situation is. And like I said, my, my training was in design engineering. It's about being able to look at a big picture and coming up with holistic solutions. Sometimes I need to rework the system entirely. Sometimes it's a, it's a simple patch to the system that I have in terms of making some small change one, uh, here, here or there. It's about understanding about what's uh, culturally sensitive, what's applicable based on the game, what's applicable based on the patch, what's applicable based on the time frame that we have, right? So every time right. the, the dynamic changes, every time the circumstances change, uh, I will always have to tweak, if not redesign the system at times, 
to to do it. So I'll, it's a it's a question of like even science within the 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 season itself. I have to look at it and say, that, okay, there's some things over here that clearly aren't working. Be it that the players has to have a very high resistance to us doing some of the things over here, and then we have to make some changes to adapt accordingly. But at the end of the day, these type of, of things is always like, okay, what are the various stakeholders? What are the various factors? How do we consider these sort of things? And um, what I always tell people as coaches is that as a coach, at the end of the day, you decide, right? And you have to make that clear to people because um, you should have the agency and at the same time, you have to bear the responsibility. Right. That's a big one, right? Uh, advocate for responsibility. That's uh, beautifully put. So, like, uh, I think we're slowly <clears throat> going into, like, the end of, like, this podcast. Um, is there one particular thing that you feel like, okay, I'm passionate about this. I would like to go into this, like, as, like, a final uh, place to, to talk about. Maybe something you want to express or maybe something about your systems, your domains or anything else you feel like, hey, let's let's... Let's talk a little bit about this because it really is important to me and also for others to understand this. Well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do you one better, okay? I, I okay, yeah, uh, yeah, up me. <laughs> a former colleague of mine asked me to 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 write down what's uh what's ten things ten things I would tell a new coach, right? Okay, yeah, let's some go. of it I talked about before already throughout the course of course of this podcast, but I'll just read through the ten things, right? Yeah, number one. Tactics comes from the understanding of interactions between systems, right? And as we talked about, everybody, especially as a new coach, someone who comes from the game knowledge side of things, I've been there. I know what it feels like. You think that your system is the best in the world and everybody else around <laughs> you is dumb, right? But you have to understand how do other people's systems work, and then that's when you will level up your tactical game to the next level. Okay. Right. Piece of advice number two. Coaching capital is your most important resource, right? We talk about buy and all those sort of things. Your charisma and your ability to sell your ideas will give you a larger amount to start with. But as the season goes, be conscious of what is depleting this capital and know what increases the capital as well and know what you want to spend your coaching capital on as well. Mm, and right? capital, you mean like time, resources, energy? Oh, uh, it's not so much about that. It's like, is this unspoken resource? It's like you can say it's the trust between coaches and players. Happens right. in all the sports teams. This is this is the type of things that losing decreases it, winning increases it uh, most of the time. And of course, positive interactions increase it, negative interactions decrease it as well. The higher right. your coaching capital is, the more likely your players will, when you ask them to jump off a bridge, will do so unquestioningly. <laughs> right? Of course, don't go and ask your players to do that, but that's the idea over there. Yeah, so it's like, um, I try to maybe, because capital, like, it's not really a common use. Like, in, I understand what you're saying, but I'm trying to maybe find a different wording. Maybe, like, uh, respect or trust, something like that. Um, like, leverage or, um, yeah, yeah, some, something like that. Along those lines, a little bit of everything, right? The, I believe, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I frame it as capital because it's a resource of sorts that you can spend in some scenarios, right? When you tell the players, trust me, just do this with enough time, no questions. Oh, right? yeah, right. You are spending yeah. capital for that. Right? right. Or when you want to tell the player that, okay, you need to start working out, you need to start on your working on your diet, things that have, they have a very natural high resistance to, that spans capital for you. Right. Do, right. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's more of an emotional it. quantity that's happening over mm, there. Yeah. Okay. So piece of advice number three. Players will often choose the easiest and simple, simplest path of, path of resistance. Goes back to what I talked about, right? When you ask people for what they want, it isn't necessarily going to be what they need. Right. Okay? Facts. They'll always give you the simplest thing that is the easiest for them. People tend to shortchange themselves, look at what they do, look at how they respond to things instead. To figure right. out what is it they actually want. Number four, we talked about this also a little bit earlier. Establish expectations with management early on, right? Are we trying to win in the next three months? Are we trying to develop and have a three-year plan? What are the plans going to be like? What are the results-wise expectations that their management have from you? And is this something that they are spending at a level that gives you a realistic chance of doing that? Mm. Okay. Number five is profiling your players to help identify and address the needs uh, more adequately. 
So it goes back to the four domains of things, being able to split things and say that th that's the system that I use to perform my player set, right? Is this a performance issue? Is this a relationship issue? Is this a knowledge issue? Or is it a systems issue where they're not following on, up on things yeah. that they should, should have been doing, right? And if you're able to break things down um, with whatever structure that you have and draw your necessary profiles, you will be able to administer help more accurately as well. Right. Number awesome. six, this is a very important one for me as somebody who has worked in minor regions for most of my career and has had to run a very tight and small team is that you don't have to do everything alone. Do not be afraid to mm. ask for help. As much as you tell your players, okay, you can go and look for these external sources of support, realize and know where your own sources of support can come from, right? Be it from the knowledge department, be it from a performance department, be it mm. even from an emotional department, right? What is your outside network that can help you? And that's a very important resource to have. Or yeah. even within the team itself, right? Who can you turn to for help within the team environment? Yeah, I th I think that's uh, hugely overrated because when I heard this, you say it felt like, oh yeah, this is sounds so logical, but I believe this is so much of a struggle within teams that especially coaches they don't ask for help enough, right? They are so much in their bubble. Um, you know, players are, you know, they have this culture of like, yeah, you know, if I don't know something, I'm going to talk to my buddies, you know, etc. interchange game knowledge. But when it comes to the coaching uh, perspective, right, it's like, oh, I, I find it hard to ask other coaches because it's like an ego dent for me. Like, oh, I don't know uh, this answer or I, I feel like I'm lacking in something. Um, while if you are, you know, taking full responsibility, Right, what you what you uh, also said is like, then you will be able to find solutions and to overcome your ego and to provide the best solution for yourself and your players. So I think this is for sure like a big one. Number six is a big one. Yeah. All right, man. Continue. You're on the roll. Number seven. Know <laughs> when to bend it and know when to develop. Periodization strategies um, is a bottom lesson to have. Right. Know that at what point of time you should be focused on pushing players into more uncomfortable scenarios and at what point of time to say okay you know what i'm gonna let you guys have the reins it's less about me it's all about you now uh and play to what's comfortable for you guys and hope that you have established the necessary structures for them accordingly right, right. okay number eight this is has to do with uh in-person interactions right sometimes it's about addressing problematic behavior is that stop that i don't like that you need to cut that out it's a mm. very powerful sentence that when you apply it immediately, actually has a very high amount of impact, right? right? You can call it Pavlovian training or whatsoever. It's as simple as like ringing the bell or whatsoever, but just telling the best, stop that. That's not nice. I do not appreciate you taking in a, talking in that way. I do not appreciate the language that you're using here, right? Exactly. It has a very good effect when used immediately. And the longer you wait to intervene, the less effectiveness it gets. I was just about to say that exactly, man. This is... Maybe, uh, especially for upcoming coaches, uh, out of the, 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 the tips you've just said, maybe the most important one to start off, right? To really practice, to when you see behavior that you don't like, basically that is not beneficial for the player or the team, to immediately address it. It will save you so much headaches, right? Because if you let, let it go, you know, you're going to have really, really tough time sometimes to rewind it back to where you want it to be. And it costs a lot of energy and time and resources. Okay. Number nine, have a strong feedback loop that goes past winning or losing. Be it having a player journal where the players write down things that they, that they are learning every single day. So that even if you're losing, you can show them, that, hey, this is what we've been learning on a day-to-day -day basis. We are not wasting our time here. You're still developing as a player. That mm -hmm. actually helps you out so much, right? But the important thing is to be able to decouple and show players that and have something to fall back on so that you, it can kind of like decouple the emotions of winning and losing away from the process they are trying to develop. Right. And the last and most important one is trust your instincts. More often, more often than not, they're correct. But to work on your instincts, sorry, but to act on your instincts is to act without overreacting. Hmm. Sounds a little go, bit like go, a yeah, no, go problem, a little bit right? more. I, I like the sentence. Act without overreacting. What do you mean with that? Okay, so a lot of times we dub the own instincts, especially in like because of all the, the, the unspoken social conventions of society. Right. Right? And we always fear that we're going to overreact. So we end up underreacting. 
if somebody's behaving to you in a passive aggressive manner at a meeting, it can be like something's wrong over here, right? Mm. And you have three options, right? One is to make a scene, right? Yeah. And then call them nasty names, be passive aggressive back and es- escalate the situation. The second is what a lot of people choose to do. So not do anything about it. Yeah. Right? Ignore it. It's like, wow, that guy is such an asshole. I'm just gonna go home and complain to my friends about that, you know? <laughs> Yeah, this, this guy James was an asshole dude at work today. It's like, wh- what does he mean by, oh, thank you so much for your contribution? He's just being sarcastic at me, you know? Yeah. It's easy. It's, it's, it's easy. It's fun to complain about it. But your instincts yeah. are on fire, right? It's like, something's wrong over here. The third option is to address it in a civil and cordial manner, right? Mm-hmm. After the meeting or whatsoever, it's like, you put James and say, hey, James, uh, there's something happened today. Did I, did I do something that pissed you off or whatsoever? And I think if you approach things in a, in a rather cordial manner, of course, sometimes it's on them, right? They're just going to continue to be an ass to you, and yep. you can't change anything about that. But more, more often than not, it goes back to the whole, stop it, I don't like that thing, right? If you address things immediately and you okay. act appropriately in a civil manner, it often creates a resolution to whatever that's happening. Right. And that is a skill in itself to be able to listen to your instincts and say that your instincts are telling you that something's wrong over here and to trust them. Same thing goes back to implicit and explicit knowledge. We, we have been coaching, you've been coaching for X number of years. You have lived life and have had leadership positions. You've had to make decisions for this many number of years, right? The mm-hmm. fact that you're not dead yet it shows that you're pretty darn good <laughs> at making decisions, right? Yep. You're pretty darn good at making decisions. You didn't jump off a bridge when you had the opportunity to, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'm sorry, that's uh, that, that was inappropriate of me, but I'm just trying to highlight that in general, people are better. We got what you're trying to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people are better at decision making than than they give themselves credit for, and uh, you might not be able to express it ex- explicitly, but the amount in- implicit intuition that you have is actually pretty darn good. Yeah, and being able to listen to that and be and the the important part is to be able to act appropriately on that. That's the part that I think a lot of people need to work on. I myself included, right? How do I handle a scenario? How do I, what is considered appropriate? Because there's a Goldilocks problem, right? You overreact, you escalate the issue, you underreact, and then people get away with bad behavior. Mm. But I will have to say, I'm going to be honest here, um, overreacting might just be better than underreacting for your personal development. But socially, why people choose not to, to react is that you yeah. get punished disproportionately for overreacting. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe just like it's, I think it's so true, right? So proportionally have a reaction or act accordingly. So if someone is calling you out sarcastically, right? Oh, that was a great comment that you just made. You know, it's, it's, it's not big, but you know, it annoys you. Your brain is on fire. How would you say, like, can you react accordingly or what are, you know, Help us a little bit, you know, to fill that scenario in so people have an idea how that looked like. Because everyone now that's watching this, listening this, wants to act accordingly. So now you have to model it. <laughs> Sorry, what was the scenario again? If somebody's behaving in a I don't, passive, yeah, 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 yeah passive aggressive, just like a sarcastic uh, comment or something. Well, I mean, I, I think it's just simply simply just addressing and say, hey, either, okay, if one, it, it genuinely disturbs you, just let them know, hey, I don't like the way that you're talking to me. Right? Is that something that you'd like to bring up instead? Right? Yeah. Something as simple as uh, just being direct with it, but without uh, making it personal, right? Making it say that, okay, you're making me feel uncomfortable here. Is an issue that's happening? Address yeah. that immediately. Address the immediate, addressing the immediate discomfort is actually a very effective strategy in general. Right? Telling yeah. somebody, I do not like the joke that you're making, right? Uh, can we come up with a better one? Or, or, just expressing general discomfort because mm-hmm. you're not making it about them. You're just saying that, okay, there's something that, that I'm experiencing. And like I said, more, more often than not, people are being accommodating to a certain degree. And of course, like I said, mm-hmm. there's always going to be, uh, there are always going to be people who are just generally uh, belligerent in general, and you cannot help that. So yeah. uh, if it comes to that, then that is really about what your prior relationship is like, what exactly has happened, and uh, or maybe they're just really having a bad day. Right. Yeah, I, I also like I also like that you said like uh, ask the question. Is there anything else you want to say? Mm-hmm. Like you, I hear this. Like you're being like you're being sarcastic, or I don't like to talk to you. Uh, how you talk to me like the uh, like this, or uh, talk to uh, talk like this uh, in the moment? Is there anything else 
you would like to say, because then it, it goes directly to the true message, right? It, it opens up a door as well for a conversation. So, yeah, I, I think that, that that's a good example, you know, to think about like an appropriate reaction, basically immediately addressing what what is in front of you, what is, you know, unfolding and then addressing it in the best way you can. You know, there's not always a best way. Sometimes you will stumble, especially in the beginning, but if you never practice, right? Uh, to stumble and be prepared to fail or prepared to be looked like a fool or prepared to be penalized for whatever, then you don't know where the boundaries are or, you know, you cannot protect your own boundaries. So, yeah, uh, I, li I like that a lot. So, yeah, Jensen, I believe that was number 10. So the, uh, are those uh, the... the um, how do you how do you say that like uh, the Jensenisms also like uh, nah, no, those aren't Jensenisms. Those I'm not gonna say that those are, are particularly <laughs> unique to me. You know, this is actually very regular advice, regular good of good pieces of advice that I've kind of like collected throughout the years, and I'll say yeah, that I concur. Is, it's it's a it's just things that you have been told, and you probably need to hear more. You know. Yeah, yeah, I like that, you know, because, you know, we don't need to learn more things, but usually the, the thing that we mostly need is to remind ourselves of the things that we know. All right. So, yeah, for sure. Um, so, Jensen, um, right, even though you had like 10 pieces of advice, right, you know, like one of my final questions is like, okay, one final piece of advice, but you already gave 10 pieces of advice. Or is there maybe one overarching type of advice based on everything and the context and system structures of this podcast that you want to leave the coaches with or the people that are watching? Sure. I can give one last piece of advice. This is a right, universal truth, okay, about the game of League of Legends, right? It goes all the way back to something that Confucius said, right? That in the game of League of Legends, the better jungler wins. No! <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, I mean, I, I've covered enough at, at this point of time. That's not my, that's not my favorite jokes, but <laughs> it, it was a good one. Everyone was like, "Oh, you see, <laughs> he's tipping his fingertips." Like, "Oh, it's gonna be good." Yeah, it was good. You caught me off guard with that one. It was a good one. Um, so yeah. Um, if there are people listening, watching uh, to you right now, how can they get into contact with you and also maybe support you in your quest to, you know, and want to learn more about you? What are some ways, you know, to get in touch with you? Oh, you can reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, it's at, at Jensen Go L O L J E N S C N G O H L O L, and um. If you, I do regular tactical content on my Patreon where I break down certain tactics that teams are using on it. So you can subscribe to that as well if you're more interested in the tactical side of the game. All right, awesome. So what is next for you, Mr. Jensen? What is next? What are your ne next step right now? Uh, how is the near future looking like? Of course, you're looking for like a program to, to support with all of your um, richness and coaching stuff. But what is there um, laid out for you? Well, at the moment, I'm I'm in talks with some teams. At the moment, I can't share uh, what exactly or who exactly. Of course, but undisclosed. I, I, my <laughs> my options uh, are quite open at the moment. I'm looking at some projects. Uh, that I can't really talk about at the moment, but um, I'm excited for what's coming up. But uh, as I say, I'm always open to to people who want to reach out. I'm always open to people who are looking for uh to to further the program, so to develop what is effectively an effective talent pipeline. And uh, I definitely am moving a lot of these lessons. Like I said, game knowledge is only twenty five percent. That's a lot that I can bring to your program as well. If you're looking at doing Valorant, Rocket League, or whatever else, uh, other major titles over there, there's a lot to that can be learned from my effectively one decade of working in esports here, be it as a shoutcaster or, or, or a coach. And I I'll be excited to bring those experiences and learnings, be it if you're doing mobile esports or any other game as well. Awesome, Jensen. So if you guys are watching this and you feel like, hey, this guy has some wise and smart things to say, and I feel like, yeah, he can help me for sure. Be sure to reach out. So yeah, I believe that is the answer. Thank you so much, Jensen Go, for joining on the Next Level Esports podcast. And as well for you, the watcher and listener, thank you so much for tuning in. If you like the podcast, hit the like and subscribe button. Or if you want to become a better coach yourself, then for sure download the free ebook in the description below or connect with the worldwide coaching network and learn more about Next Level Esports. Then also head down to the description below where you will find a couple of links to get you to your next level. My name is Donnie from Next Level Esports and I see you guys next time. Ciao, ciao.